Welcome everybody, Tom Gentile. Glad to be with you again for Tom's Trading Essentials. This is week number three. We will be focusing on advanced charting tonight. And my special guest, Mark Chaikin, is with me from Chaikin Analytics. We'll get into him, and I'm actually going to have him doing a, a good bit of our advanced charting here in just a few minutes. Uh, before we begin, however, let me uh, mention this. This session's being recorded. We'll get the recording to you ASAP, which means soon after the live event is over. Um, I probably will have it up for you guys tomorrow, um, but um, for those of you who are live tonight, you're really going to love this because you will be ready for the markets when they open again tomorrow. Um, also, I want to mention that if you have any questions, comments, et cetera, you can, if you're live with us, you can put them right in the Q&A tab there. All right. If you're not live with us, then you can uh, feel free to email us, support at TomGentile.com, and we'll get uh, as many of your questions answered as possible. Uh, again, I'm going to apologize right off the bat because we have so many people in the room tonight that um, we may not be able to get to every question or comment that's out there. But trust me, we'll get to as many as we can. And finally, the disclaimer you see on the screen here, um, you can read it in its entirety. All you have to do is just hit pause on the recording once you receive it. Two things I'm going to mention real quick. Number one, stock and options trading has large potential rewards, but also large potential risk. And number two, all right, uh, this has to do with optionetics, myself, Tom's Trading Room, uh, Jay Harris, who works with me, and anyone else, including guests like Bart Chaikin. We are here as educators to show you how it is that we navigate and trade the markets. All right, we're not investment advisors. We do not give personalized investment advice. And everything that we're going to talk about tonight is in U.S. dollars and less noted otherwise. So um, let's talk about week three. I want to do a quick review of one and two. We're going to get into a, uh, the half a dozen or so stocks that we talked about last week and see where they are at this point. And then we're going to jump straight into advanced charting. So I want to first remind all of you. Of, you know, of what we do, uh, spotting opportunity, creating low risk trades and planning, executing and managing those trades. And so uh, what I want to do is I want to talk about these things. I want to do an outlook on SPY. I want to talk about Bitcoin. We were talking about that last week. I want to talk about USO bearish. We talked about that last week. And I want to focus on the three stocks that we looked at as spread trades and see where they are right now. Um, and kind of where they they uh, are perhaps likely to go in the grand scheme of things. All right. So with that, let's slide on over and let's start with the S&P. So um, where's the big pointer at? Let's put the big pointer on because we need that. There we go. OK, uh, S&P 500, 100 day chart. As you can see, we're using TomsOptionTools.com, which we've been using for the last couple of weeks. The lows. And these are uh, these blue dots here, or these dotted uh, dashed areas here are what we call stock chart peaks. All right. The blues are support. The blacks are resistance. Uh, resistance can become support, as it did today for SPY. The resistance back in July has now also become the support today, although we closed slightly below it. I believe that we're going to see this 322 to 323 area potentially taken out. And of course, 300, not only is it a round number resistance for SPY, it also is our stock chart peak resistance going back over the last 100 days. All right. Big move we had to the downside. The other thing I want to mention is take a look at the red line. The red line is implied volatility as it was up here near 36 back in June, right? When we had that little double bottom that occurred. IV dropped all the way down the teens. Then it started moving higher as we melted up. You remember that at the end of August, we had that quick pullback. That brought us up a little bit. And this kind of ABC correction that happened that took us into this double area of support. We bounced off of that. But look what's happened recently. We're not even down in this area yet. And take a look at IV. Options prices are shooting up like crazy. This is, uh, this is what I like to call a triple uh, a triple edged sword okay not a double edged sword a triple edged sword because you got covid-19 which is causing option traders to be nervous on the SPY you've got big earnings reports that are coming out later this week most likely tomorrow afternoon with most of fang and of course we got the election results which are going to be uh, coming well we'll see 
uh, coming soon. I actually, guys, I went out, um, you know, I live in Florida. I, I'm a resident, full-time resident of Florida. Um, no matter where I may end up parking during the year, um, Florida is my home. Uh, my wife and I went to early voting today. And let me tell you, the lines for early voting here in Florida in my county, it went from town hall. It went around it went around the entire town hall and down the street. And so it was taking I want to say it took a couple hours to vote. And that was early voting. So this is I've never seen anything for early voting this long since I've been voting. So um, I found it uh, quite interesting that uh, we are going to have. I believe we're going to have very high voter turnout if what's happening in my town is happening most likely everywhere else. Uh, a lot of that is cause is causing the nervousness in the markets right now, that threefold uh, scenario that we see going on. OK, so let's move forward. Uh, USO, we've been talking about being bearish now, and uh, this is due to the seasonal bear that's going on in oil. And so really kind of started at the end of August, beginning of September. And so beginning of September, uh, now typically we see bullishness in oil from mid-February to around July 4th, right? But that got pushed because of COVID-19. Oil didn't start going up until two months later in April. So fast forward to Labor Day, which was the first Monday in uh, November and we're, or September, and we're talking about crew or USO being around 30. Today it hit 26.31 and it, it had an initial drop and it's moved sideways, but it's popped down again. And we've hit three areas that are bottoms here. This is a very interesting level of support that I believe we're going to crush simply because we're in the seasonal bear right now. And expect the seasonal bear for oil to last until guess when? February. All right. So that one moving in our direction. Now, gold is a very interesting one because I've been talking about with several groups that I really like gold long term, right? That if we continue to print US dollars, that it's gonna have a positive effect on commodities and, and uh, ETFs like GLD. However, I also have been talking about the fact that gold has been running into what we call a pennant formation, where we've got these, these higher lows happening and these lower highs at the same time. And something had to give. And we thought last week when it had a little pop up, and that pop-up happened to do with uh, the rumors that the next round of stimulus was coming. Well, that didn't happen. We ran right back in the, into the, the small little tight area we've been in. Well, today we dropped down. And although we're not down at the 175 mark, which is the area of support that we're looking for, we're not that far away. We're only a 1.14 uh, 1 away from that, that uh, dotted line you see there. Otherwise, the next low for GLD is going to be in the high 160s. All right. So uh, gold may be short term down and long term up. Um, of course, time will tell with that. So we were talking about um, three different stocks and I want to follow what they've done in the last couple of weeks. All right. So if you remember two weeks ago, we were talking about AZO and we talked about AZO uh, not only a couple of weeks ago, but we were talking about calls. We were talking about just call options and sales and AZO we've seen kind of go up. But then this week we see it drop back down. So it's down a little bit below where we first started talking about it. If you take a look at um, now AutoZone, let me back up and look at AutoZone for a second. Let me zoom in here. This is actually not a bad day for AutoZone, considering that uh, major markets dropped on average three and a half percent today. For AutoZone to open at 1120 and actually go up while the rest of the market was going lower. And close at 11:28 when the day when just the previous day we were not that that much higher. That's actually pretty good. But when you look at the week, the week has been rough for for AutoZone. The week prior we had a nice little move from 11:60 all the way up to 1,200. But now we're back down to 11:28. So you know, look at this. It's about about 30 points or so off from uh, week one when we first started looking at this. Next is AutoDesk. Autodesk kind of has the same kind of setup on it. If you go back uh, two weeks, Autodesk was at 245, right? Where is it at today? 237. So yes, it ran all the way up to near 270. And yes, it ran from 270 back down, right? But that's part of that move there uh, that started back when we started our, um, our sessions together, right back here two weeks ago. 
right? So that's Autodesk. Now that was the 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 six uh, securities that I wanted to talk about, with the exception of one. Last week, two weeks ago, we started talking about Bitcoin, and we were discussing Bitcoin. We were discussing it when it was in the the twelve thousand. Well, actually, you go back two weeks ago, we were at eleven five. We we're in this eleven five area, and I talked about the fact that we broke out of an, an area here. Look at you can see this was a wedge, but also we were looking at this this crossover that occurred. And this crossover occurred in around the 10.7, 10.8 area. And then again, we started talking about it when it was around 11.5. And last week we were talking about it, we were still below 13,000. We ran up uh, to around 13.8 this morning. I mean, early this morning, like when everyone's sleeping, before we had the pullback. Right now we're at 13,241. And I expect to see a lot more of this volatility to happen, but I also would not surprise me in the least that by Tuesday, this is somewhere between 14 and 15,000 uh, per coin. All right, so that's my my uh, discussion on uh, stocks, the, the overall market, uh, and the majority of what, what, what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. All right, now we went into option trades, we went into calls on week one, we went into call spreads and put spreads on week two, and uh, again, you know, you look at some of the, the damage that the market's done and being a call spreader, you know, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm down this week. All right. Anybody that was long the market, whether they're long stocks, whether they're long uh, derivatives or whether they were long options or option spreads are down in some form, some form. All right. But my losses, my account are significantly less, they were significantly less today than the overall markets, than the S&P or the Dow or the Qs. And primarily that's because of two things. A, I mostly trade options. In fact, there's only one stock that's in my portfolio today that is an actual stock, Papa John's Pizza. What did Papa John's do today? It was up, all right? But I've got, I've got calls on that too. I've got a, I, I took a trade and I converted it. And I changed it into a cover call because I got assigned on the stock and I was happy to do so. But the other reason that I'm significantly down is I've been building a cash position just for this kind of occurrence that's starting to happen. And then over the last several months, I've been building my cash position uh, to get ready for what I like to call things that that may go on sale soon. All right. So um, but options are a big, big portion of that, that lower risk with still the ability to have those above average returns. Now, um, let's move into some charts that are outside of what we've been looking at the last couple of weeks. So joining me right now is Mark Chaikin. Mark is the founder of Chaikin Analytics. Uh, you may know, you may have heard of his name if you've never heard of him before or heard him speak before. Maybe you've heard of him from one of the many different indicators that uh, he has made famous throughout the world. And it is an honor to have him with us again. I probably have him here, I don't know, once a year or so. So it's exciting to have you here, Mark, on a day, a uh, historic week, which I'm gonna let you talk about. But on a day, we haven't seen a move like this since uh, what, July? Since July and actually since 1928. 28, and why 28? What makes that number? Uh, informative this is the only day in a week preceding a presidential election that's been down more than three percent since 1928 wow and i have handed over the um the uh, presentation to you and i can see uh let's see i see something on the screen there advanced charting techniques using chicken analytics all right we're ready to go thank you tom so, and thank you Yep. Uh, are we good uh, sound wise? Let's get Absolutely. a sound check. All right. Loud well, thank clear. you. Yeah, and I'm actually going to look at one chart. It's going to be a bearish chart uh, that we looked at a year ago in August, August of 19. And I think you're going to be shocked to see what happened to one of the energy stocks that we were bearish on back then. But let's get started by looking at my background. Tom's been around a long time. I've been around a little bit longer, 50 years on Wall Street. <laughs> yeah. I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, 45 years using technical analysis. 
but always in conjunction with fundamentals. What we're going to talk about on the, t tonight's webinar is that if you bring something else to the technical analysis party, you're going to do better. Whether it's John's trades, whether it's Jim Cramer's trades, whether it's Tom's seasonal patterns, if you bring something else to technical analysis, you're going to do a better job. For me, it's fundamentals. But fundamental analysis is hard. Technical analysis is what helped me survive 10 bear markets. But fundamentals drive the market. We're going to look at that and show you how you can know what the fundamental potential for any stock is. And our model has been bullish on AutoZone, on Autodesk. We can't get out of the A's, Tom. Amazon, you name it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but here's the key. Fundamental analysis is hard. We make it easier. And we yeah, do you've that. Actually, you've actually been able to take fundamental analysis and really visualize it, where a lot of and folks just say, quantitative. We've made it quantitative, but it it has to be visual. It's too hard to look at the numbers. We'll sh we'll show you that. The quantitative factors are what the successful institutional investors look at every day. You and I had, don't have enough time to do that, and. The people who have embraced the Chaikin Power Gauge Rating, our quantitative model, it looks at 20 factors, like Tom, see the visual as compelling. If you have to look at the numbers all day long, you're going to walk away from it shaking your head. So when I went into a one and a half year research project, basically put my head down, didn't talk to my wife. We had just moved to Philadelphia. She was happy going out to the ballet and the orchestra. And in a year and a half, I basically fulfilled my life's dream, which was to level the playing field for individual investors and traders so that they could take advantage of what the smartest and most successful institutional investors look at every day. We call it the Chaikin Power Gauge Rating. And when we're talking about advanced charting, I want to simplify it. So the first aspect of charting is the trend. The trend is your friend. Marty Zweiger said that. Tom's talking about it earlier here. Trend analysis is actually very easy. Following it is hard. That's the key. You've got to, when you identified the trend, don't second guess it. And you've got to look at relative performance. Relative performance tells you everything you need to know. And we look at relative performance two ways. If a stock's in the home building group, is the home building group outperforming the market? If it's in energy, is the energy group outperforming or underperforming? I don't need to tell anybody, energy is underperforming the market. That's what that USO chart was all about. And then we look at the individual stock and we compare it to the SPY, to the S&P 500. And those two relative performance measurements tell you everything you need to know to find winning stocks and to tell you what to avoid. And then finally, it's volume analysis. And for 38 years, Shake and Money Flow, which I know many of you are familiar with, has proven itself. It tells you what the smart money is doing. We launched it in 1982. It's now on every one of your online brokerage platforms, stockcharts.com. And it's the third leg of the stool. When you're talking about advanced charting, simplify it. I've been there. I, I, when I was day trading, I looked at every oscillator known to man. The bottom line is these are the three indicators. These are the three pieces of that technical analysis stool that you need. Trend, relative performance, and volume. Check and Money Flow does a great job of synthesizing volume. It tells you what the smart money is doing. So raise your hands if volatility has spooked you recently. We're talking about VIX above 40. When VIX goes above 25, you've got to be very cautious about the short term. So, Tom, are you seeing any response from the uh, people on the webinar? We've got over 600 people on the webinar. 
Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, folks are, um, uh, you know, uh, instead of raise your hand, I uh, want you guys just tell us, you know, um, do you love volatility or do you hate it? Uh, because I got some guys in here that absolutely love volatility because they're using they're using option selling strategies uh, against the vol. But and and you know, it's interesting. Most people here say they love it. There's a couple saying they're on the sidelines, and then there's a couple saying, yeah, this is kind of spooky. So that's interesting, Tom, because what's really driving the market right now, U.S. dollar. The market is trading inverse to the U.S. dollar. When the U.S. dollar is up, the market goes down. That's what happened over the last three days. And the other thing that I think is affecting the market is volatility. So a lot of people have bet on the election. Smart money, big institutions. So what have they done? They've basically been shorting volatility. Mm. The market makers, shorting volatility. The institutions, they're long volatility. So what's happening is volatility spikes up above 40. Market makers are short volatility, which means they've got to sell stocks. That's what's been yeah. happening over the last three days. It's a, it's a pattern you know very well, Tom. The key to the folks on the webinar is how do you take advantage of that or step out of the way? So you've talked about stepping aside 3,200 on the S&P key level. I'm gonna show you why that's a key level. It's been a wild ride so far in 2020. 23 day bear market, think about that. 23 days down over 30%. Mm -hmm. And then a new bull market. And here's the key. We broke out above 3,000 and particularly above 3,200. You've identified that as a key zone. And the reason 3,200 is important, that's a 10% drop from the rally peak on September 2nd. As we'll see on the next slide, as long as you stay above a 10% pullback, you're likely to bounce very quickly. So right now, we're still in that 5 to 10% pullback zone. However, our power gauge rating on the SPY is now neutral. It's no longer bullish. Institutions have gotten much more cautious. Here's Chaik and Money Flow. It's a one-year chart of the SPY. You can see that institutions were using SPY as a equity surrogate. Instead of picking individual stocks, they were buying SPY. Gave them instant equity exposure, just like they were doing in November, December, January into the February peak. What's happening now is that institutions have pulled back into the election. A lot of unknowns, double dip in Europe. But we've still contained this decline in this 8 to 10% pullback range. If we break 3,200 on a closing basis, I'm going to put on some hedges, pull in the reins, but I don't want to get bearish here. Because the QQQ, the tech stocks, the NASDAQ 100 is really where the action is. And that uptrend is still intact. We still have this pattern of higher highs and higher lows. Now, we made a lower high in the QQQ, but we haven't broken that 260 level. So we're in this zone where the market makers are pushing the market down. That's what happened Monday, it happened today. But we've got to look at the underlying fundamentals. The power gauge rating for the QQQs is still bullish. And we're still in this five to 10% pullback range for the SPY. So the reason that's important is as long as the decline on a closing basis is contained within 10%, we're in a pullback. There have been 80 of them now since 1945. They last a month, and within a month, you recover to new highs. When you close, if you close below 10% down, now you're in a correction. And corrections usually result in a double bottom. So you have to protect your capital in a correction. 
been 30 of them since 1945. They average 14%. They take four months. Their correction back to the new high is four months. So that 3,200 area, taking it from a totally different direction than Tom did. Tom did it strictly from a charting point of view. Good way to look at it. We're looking at a historic point of view. That's really critical. So when we're in an area where VIX is high, it's above 40, market makers are pushing the market down because they're hedging their positions. I like to look at sentiment indicators and you can pay an awful lot of money for some very good but expensive sentiment services. Or you can go to CNN and look at their fear and greed index. As of three o'clock today, and these are updated hourly. This is actually as of four o'clock. Fear is back. A week ago, we were in the greed territory, and then we got this sort of S storm of COVID cases, Europe shutting down, concern about the election, volatility up. We're now in a fear zone. If we go below 30, we're going to be in that extreme fear territory. And for me, when Investors are fearful. I'm going to be looking for opportunities. This is Warren Buffett at his best. Investors should be fearful when others are greedy and greedy only when others are fearful. So we're starting to see fear creep into the market. More than creep, VIX above 40 is a big fear indicator. But remember, sentiment is a contrary indicator. It's not a timing indicator, but I love to know the backdrop. So when I look at VIX and I look at the fear and greed index, I'm seeing fear creep into the market. So I want to know what to buy. You know, what are the auto zones, the auto desks of today? Because if I know what to buy, I've solved the problem that we all face. We're traders. We're investing in our 401k plan. We're going to use technical analysis to determine what to buy, but we also want to put the odds in our favor. So whether it's a seasonal pattern or whether it's fundamental analysis, we need something more. And then once we know what we have, you've got to know when the actionable setups are there. So we've pioneered this approach of combining fundamentals with technicals. It's what got Tom and I together five years ago, back together, because we knew each other back in the 90s. Yeah. And it's why all these big institutions are using Chaikin Analytics. But the big edge for traders is combining fundamentals with technicals. Fundamentals drive the market but emotions drive the market to extremes. And when VIX is above 25 and it moved above 40 today, you know that emotions are driving the market. In this case, it's market makers. It's dealers, not the public. Public is sort of the, the observer here. But for me, in 50 years on Wall Street, the path to profits has always been to combine fundamentals and technicals. The problem is, as we said earlier, fundamental research is tough time consuming. So we've distilled it down to the gauge. It goes from very bearish to very bullish. It's a simple display, but under the surface there's a lot of number crunching. Tom, on a webinar you did about two years ago, you talked about hundreds of millions of calculations every day to compute your seasonal factors. That's right. And we're doing hundreds of millions of calculations every night on 5,000 US equities and ETFs. And what that does is it gives you a directional edge. For me, that's what trading's all about. It's having a directional edge. Again, whether it's seasonal, fundamental, pattern recognition, if you've got something you can rely on, your technical analysis is gonna be so much more powerful. So what the Chaikin Power Gauge rating does is it makes complex fundamental analysis simple takes all that data on the right side of the screen, distills it down to a rating on the left side. Now that's a screenshot of Starbucks in January of 19, 2019. It was bullish 65 on the way to 99. 
But the key is you don't want to be looking at that fundamental data. That's a distraction. What you want to be is looking at setups. So Tom gave us this wonderful quote four years ago. I think that's the first year we actually did these webinars, Tom. Oh, yeah. And Tom zeroed in on the fact that we've got an algorithm that you can't find in any other charting program. And for me, it's the directional edge that options traders need. So what's in the power gauge rating? It's four components, value, growth, technicals, that's only 15% of the models, and sentiment, that's our secret sauce. And within each of those four categories, five factors. Now what makes the power gauge unique is that these are the factors that successful investors look at every day. In the old days, it was Peter Lynch at Fidelity. It was Bill Miller at Leg Mason. It was Roger McNamee at T. Rowe Price. These were my clients. I learned from them. I looked over their shoulder. I showed them how to incorporate technical analysis into their fundamental decision making. And then when I set about to build the Chaikin Power Gauge rating, I drew on everything I had learned from them. But the key here is that these factors are what successful investors look at every day. You've got a lot of different styles and time horizons in the melting pot that we call the stock market. And the unique blend of those factors is what makes the power gauge rating so valuable. I've highlighted just one of the sentiment factors, industry group relative strength. If you have ever seen a herd of cattle or a flock of geese or people in the stock market, you know that there's a herding effect. And industry group relative strength, as we'll see in a few minutes, puts the odds in your favor because it tells you where the herd is moving and where they're putting their bets. So the, the power here is in the performance. Over 20 years, 10 of which are back-tested, 10 of which are real-time performance, the average very bullish stock in taken power gauge rating up almost 17%, double the market averages. The average very bearish stock up only 2.7%. Your job as traders is to shoot the bears. You're a hunter, you're a hunter-gatherer, you're looking for the very bullish stocks, for your long opportunities, I love vertical call spreads, just like Tom does. Get a little bit of that premium erosion working for you. And in the right market, and I don't think we're in that right now, I want to be buying put options or doing vertical put spreads. But the key is to know what the very bearish stocks are and avoid them like the plague. Because in a year like 2015, even though we were still in a bull market, the very bearish stocks in our model were down over 17%. Energy stocks, rails, small caps in general, they could have wiped you out. Kinder Morgan, Under Armour, Pioneer Resources. And guess what? Those are the stocks that are weak again in 2020. History has repeated itself. The rails are just getting destroyed, even while FedEx and UPS are doing very well, because they're old economy. UPS, FedEx particularly, as we'll see, new economy transports. But it's really important to know which stocks are very bearish. So I've distilled all this down into a pyramid which reflects the discipline methodology we've been teaching for the last five years on these webinars. Successful tra trading demands a discipline methodology. At the top of the pyramid, the Chaikin Power Gauge rating. I want fundamentals to drive my decision making. If it's Tom Gentile, that could be his seasonal patterns. Could be the yearly pattern. Which stocks go up in the fourth quarter? I can tell you one stock, Parker Hannafin's been up. Nine out of the 10 last years in the fourth quarter. 
it's an infrastructure stock. But I want to follow the take and power gauge rating. It happens to have a bullish rating in our model. That gives me encouragement. I also want to know which stocks are in strong industry groups. Once I know that, I go to the bottom of the pyramid. Two technical indicators. That's how we simplify it. Check in money flow and check in relative strength. And then in the middle, buy and sell signals. So that's what a discipline methodology incorporates. And I call this the power of three. Two technical indicators, relative strength and money flow, along with the trend and the check in power gauge rating for fundamentals. Remember, we started out by saying that fundamentals drive the market, but emotions drive the market to extremes. Let's look at that power of three in a pattern we call classic check in bulls. Power gauge ratings bullish. Stock is outperforming the market and check in money flow is strong. So we're going to look at the one-year chart of Intuit in Chaikin Analytics from the bottom up. Most people just look at the price chart. Power gauge rating is a red-green yellow ribbon at the bottom of this one-year chart. It's bullish on Intuit. Intuit's been outperforming the market since mid-August. It outperformed the market from mid-February on. And there's been intense accumulation. There's the check in money flow or the check in oscillator, if you use that, very similar. Institutions have just been buying into it on every dip. And when these three factors are in place, we're looking for buying opportunities. So this is what we call our relative strength buy signal. It's right 70% of the time. Really simple signal. You can monitor it in stockcharts.com. You can probably do it in Tom's charts. Stock that's outperforming the market dips down under its 21 day exponential average and then moves back above it. And the reason I like this signal is it tends to persist for four to eight weeks. So you can put on the appropriate options position not put yourself under the gun with weekly options that are going to expire on Friday and look for that expansion of relative performance when the market is rewarding you for identifying strong stocks. Now, in the right market, and even in this market, the classic take and bear is really important. Power gauge rating is bearish. That tells us that the fundamentals are negative for stock. Underperforming the market, shake and money flow is red, not green. Here's our poster child. It's Boeing. Power gauge rating on Boeing turned bearish above 350. It's been underperforming the market for 15 months. And the institutions are selling it every opportunity they get. Even when the stock rallies for seven days, money flow stays negative. I built it to go green. It didn't go green. Why? Because smart money is selling the rallies. And when smart money is selling the rallies, you want to be selling along with them. Bottom fishing doesn't work. So I want to go back to a webinar that Tom and I did in August of 2019. And my classic shake and bear on that webinar was Halliburton. The stock was trading at about $19. The power gauge rating had gone bearish above 40. Same as Boeing, power gauge bearish, underperforming the market, institutions selling, smart money selling the rallies. So what's happened in the 14 months since we did that webinar? Halliburton traded down to $4. So it went from 42 to 20 to four. And you don't want to be bottom fishing. The power gauge is still bearish. Money is coming out of the stock. Bottom fishing doesn't work. So if relative strength is important, we want to know one pattern that can really put you on the right side of big moves. We call it spotting personality changes. 
Personality change is a stock that's been underperforming the market that begins to outperform the market. So here's a very current example. First Solar had a bullish personality change back in May. It went from underperforming. Our relative strength indicator is a heat map. It's actually a stochastic of relative strength. It goes from red to green. If you use stockcharts.com, it's similar to their scooter indicator, but we built this over 10 years ago. So when a stock is outperforming the market with a bullish power gauge rating, we say that the market agrees with the model. And when that's true, we're looking for buying opportunities and we're looking for them right after we get that bullish personality change. So that first buy signal is what we really jump on. We don't buy it just because it starts to outperform. We look for a disciplined entry point. So we got that on first solar back in June, the stock was trading at 50. And then we got another buy signal ahead of earnings. That's a powerful signal. We're in earnings season. This is a unique earnings season. Stocks are seeing their earnings exceed expectations. 80% of the stocks so far have reported better than expected earnings and revenue, but stocks have been selling off. It's been a sell the news earnings season. So if you're lucky enough to buy a stock based on a signal ahead of earnings, you wanna sell the spike. If you leave some money on the table, that's great. Let someone else make a little money. Most of the time you get a second chance. And this is an earnings signal after earnings. And if you buy that, you sell the spike. So what happened to First Solar? And by the way, First Solar is a stock that's being bid up based on a democratic sweep. In the debates last week, Vice President Biden said, we're gonna de-emphasize carbon fuels. That's why USO is going down. And we're gonna emphasize renewable energy. And that's why stocks like First Solar and the other solar stocks are doing so well. It's a bet on the future. But when you get a spike like you did this morning, up 15%, sell the spike, take your profit. You're in the stock for all the right reasons. Take your money off the table. Now, the signals are really important. As we saw, look at, there's three signals on that chart. Four, actually. Three out of the four are big winners. One, you had to manage your trade. These are what we call our oversold buy signals. Stock with a bullish power gauge rating makes a new eight day low, gets oversold. There's a window of opportunity there. Sometimes it's just a day, sometimes it's a week. But when you're putting on your options trade, if you're putting on a vertical call spread, when the stock is down, not up, you're putting the odds in your favor. But you gotta know about these signals. So we have six pair of buy and sell signals in Chaken Analytics. But the key, no matter what your discipline, is to know about these actionable opportunities as they're happening. So two years ago, we created daily email alerts for our subscribers. It's our way of helping people be aware of what the opportunities are. So on May 1st of this year, in the NASDAQ 100, which I believe is the market leader, only one stock gave a buy signal, JD.com. Oversold buy at 43.10. Here's what JD.com looked like when that buy signal came in. Now, I will tell you that ignore the money flow on Chinese stocks because they trade in a different time zone, their primary market. Money flow is reactive, not predictive. So we're gonna ignore money flow and look at the fact that the power gauge rating was bullish and the stock was outperforming the market and gave us that buy signal ahead of earnings. And then it did it again three months later. After going from 41 to 65, the stock pulled back to 58, gave us another oversold buy signal ahead of that earnings report in August. 
And then after the spike, it pulled back and gave us another buy signal. So you can get buy signals ahead of earnings, after earnings. You got to be on the lookout for all of them. I'm going to show you right at the end of the webinar how we do that, how I stay up on what's happening in the earnings picture. So what did I get in my email this morning? I follow a list of about 40 stocks. One of them is FedEx. It gave me an oversold buy signal coming into today's trading session. Now we knew the futures were down 30, 40 points. So we're gonna look to buy weakness. So here's FedEx and some of the same patterns we've been talking about surfaced in FedEx. In July, after a very positive earnings surprise, FedEx went from underperforming the market to outperforming the market. And if you believe that visuals convey everything you need to know, I'm with you. Went from red to green, and the power gauge went bullish at the same time. That's extremely unusual. But look what happened to FedEx. It went from 160 to 297. It is the poster child for this bull market. And I will go out on a limb and tell you that as long as FedEx maintains its uptrend, this bull market is in good hands. We haven't even come close to the September low, which was down, the intraday low was down around 220 pre-market in September. As long as we hold above those September lows, as long as FedEx maintains its uptrend, the market is in good hands. Now, why is that? Well, FedEx is both a new economy stock, stay at home, work at home. You're buying from Wayfair, Amazon, Overstock. Who delivers the goods? Most of the time, it's FedEx. It's an old economy stock. If the economy picks up, once we get out of the COVID morass, goods and services moving around the country, FedEx is there with logistics. And if we're lucky enough, and I believe it's gonna happen, that we get a vaccine, guess who's gonna move that temperature sensitive vaccine around the country and around the world? FedEx. There's been an estimate that we need over 15,000 planes temperature control to take vaccine from the manufacturer to you and me. So FedEx is what I call an all weather stock and it's also a bellwether for this bull market. And I'm looking at a chart and saying, where could I have bought this? There has been no pullback. This is the first pullback since July. And we got a second earnings report in September, a positive earnings surprise, spiked up, pulled back, went on to make new all-time highs just a week ago. So this is another way to do technical analysis. Find yourself a couple of leading stocks. First Solar, FedEx, Lowe's or Home Depot. These are the real leaders in the stock market. And as long as they can maintain their uptrends, the bull market's in decent hands. Doesn't mean you can't get the kind of short-term volatility disruptions that we're seeing here but you've got to look at the bigger picture protect your capital but look for those opportunities be greedy when other people are fearful and we got an oversold buy signal i actually bought some call options on fedex when it starts to bottom out and rally i'll sell some out of the money calls and create a bull spread but we talked about industry group relative strength. It's really a second edge. Power gauge is your first edge. Industry group strength helps you pinpoint big winners and losers. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Simplify. If you're buying a stock in a strong sector or industry group, AutoZone, Autodesk, both fall into that category, you've got tailwinds. It's a lot easier to make money on the long side. So we built a power gauge rating for ETFs. We combine the power gauge ratings on the individual stocks in a given sector or industry group ETF. Then we do technical analysis on the ETF itself. It's a tradable. 
And these ratings have been out there for over two years. They've won awards, but more importantly, they help you find winning stocks. It's a simple top-down process. That's what all the successful investors I've ever worked with, whether they were clients or colleagues, do. So what we do is mirror what the institutions do. We're looking for strong industry groups and we find them with the Chaikin Power Gauge rating for industry group ETFs. Then we drill down on those industry group ETFs and our goal is to zero in on the bullish stocks with the best potential. So we start with our Power Gauge rating for the industry group ETFs in the S&P. And we see as of this morning, it was home builders, healthcare, technology, semiconductors, software. So we wanna drill down on one of those ETFs. In this case, we're gonna look at software because it's really rewarded us so well in the last 18 months. And we see that the power gauge rating for the XSW, the software ETF, has been leading the market. Power gauge rating's been bullish since late April. Outperforming the market, shaking money flow strong, that's the power of three. You can find it in individual stocks, you can find it in an ETF. And then we wanna look at which stocks in that ETF have bullish ratings. And we find stocks like APPS, like Cadence, which is a software company for the semiconductor manufacturers. And these are the stocks that we've been keying in on as traders for the last eight months and in the 18 months before that. So here's Cadence. It's a classic bull. Power gauge rating is bullish. The market agrees with the model. When that's the case and money flow is strong, we're looking for buy signals. So we got our oversold buy in May on Cadence. The stock was about 63. Trades up to a new all-time high after an earnings report above 77. These are good trades. You put on a spread with a two-month time horizon, and you're looking at a classic bull that leads to big profits. And we always love that first buy signal after an earnings report. Sometimes it happens in a week. Sometimes it takes a couple of weeks. But that first buy signal after an earnings report Strong earnings report, typically like gold. Now let's look at a stock that I actually bought today called Digital Turbine. They make ad-serving software for apps. The power gauge rating turned bullish on May 29th at a price of 642. The stock was up 550% as October peak. I started buying it at $12.40 when that buy signal triggered after an earnings report. Didn't buy it at the low. It's in a strong group, the software group. Trend is strong, higher highs, higher lows. Now we've gotten a serious correction. We did that before in August. And the stock went from 22 to 42. Earnings are due out a week from today, November 4th. I'm looking back, seeing two really powerful positive earnings surprises. But the key is, if you're looking at the right industry group, software, you're looking at the right ETF, XSW, you're going to find these stocks. So however you do it, whether you do it in stock charts or Thinkorswim or TradeStation or Schwab, you can do this, but you have to know what you're looking for. So you start with industry groups, you look at the power gauge rating, and then you look at the technicals. And when you do that, you're skewing the odds in your favor. So we, we've talked about screening for post earnings buys, looking for them. So what I do is I take a preset screen and check in analytics. I look at the companies that have reported earnings in the last week. I follow the power gauge ratings, and then I wait for one of our buy signals. So this morning, I ran this screen of the companies that have reported earnings in the last five days. Started with the S&P 500, looking for stocks with very bullish or bullish ratings. And I also wanted stocks where the analysts are raising their earnings estimates. 
So using that plus my relative strength screen, we narrowed the S&P down to 16 companies that have reported earnings in the last week. Companies like Thermo Fisher, which have blown through earnings reports. Whirlpool in the home building area. Even Ford Motor, which reported a blowout quarter after the close. You want to wait for these stocks to come back down and give you a buy signal. And the kind of market volatility and weakness we're looking at is going to create all these buying opportunities. So Tom asked me to end the webinar by looking at the FANG stocks. So Tom, you, I don't think you've seen this before. We have something we call the scorecard. It's a checklist. And it looks at all the technical factors we've been talking about, plus the power gauge rating and industry group strength. So Facebook has a bullish rating. All of the strength factors are positive, but the stock is a little bit overbought. Then we go on to Amazon. Everything is green. All the technical factors are positive. The power gauge is positive, and it's in a strong industry group. Move on to Netflix, bearish rating. We've got these scorecards for 5,000 stocks. Click of a button. And then finally, Google, a little bit of a mixed picture with a bullish power gauge rating. So if I'm going to pick among the four, what am I going to pick? All green. Amazon. Power gauge rating is bullish. Stock is holding that September low beautifully, 2800. And by clicking the checklist button, I bring up the scorecard. So everything we've talked about on tonight's webinar is encapsulated into that scorecard. You read a lot about artificial intelligence. This is real intelligence. This is a computer that can read the chart. It's not predicting anything. It's telling you what is. Fundamentals are strong. Stocks outperforming the market. It's in a strong industry group. It's oversold. Long-term trend is up. And money flow persistency is still strong. That's how you simplify advanced charting. So Tom, I'm going to turn it back to you because I know there are a lot of questions and well, you may have some of, comments here. Most of them you answered because most of them uh, involved Facebook and Amazon and, and the stocks that people were asking about stocks that are reporting earnings tomorrow. And so those were, those were most of them. Um, uh, I got a question, someone asking about how significant you see the market being down in a week preceding an election. Is this a major indicator or is this just a, you know, uh, just some uh, roadside sign. We are in uncharted waters because of COVID. Closest thing is 1918 and the Spanish flu. And by the way, very similar, President Woodrow Wilson got the Spanish flu. He wasn't that interested in containing it. And that was over 100 years ago. So I think you got to throw a lot of these chart patterns and historical analyses out the window. We're in uncharted waters. Europe is shutting down again after the close. There were new measures in Italy, Spain, and Portugal. Germany is going to follow. It, I do find it interesting, though, that and and of course it's still early in the day, but the but the uh, futures markets are actually up almost a one percentage point tonight. Um, but that could be an indication that volatility is not going to be just during the day. Uh, it's going to be twenty four five. Here, 24, at least. five, and there was some positive news on Regeneron after the close and a, a COVID vaccine. So um, I, I think that helped the futures markets. I'm surprised they're actually not up more given what we saw today. Right. Are there any? Are there any? Um, uh, I'm getting a question. Are there any gold stocks that you're that you uh, like? Have you seen if, any gold stocks? If the dollar is strong. And VIX is up. I'd rather buy Bitcoin than gold. Yeah. Strong, strong dollar right now and for the last three months has not helped gold. Anytime the dollar rallies, gold goes down. So I'm gonna I'm gonna avoid gold. I'd rather be in Bitcoin right now. 
All right, guys. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, our week three of uh, Tom's Trading Essentials. I hope you found this enjoyable and, and, and educational and also uh, a great takeaway for some of the stocks that uh, Mark is looking at. And it's actually quite interesting that uh, several of the ones that's on his list longer term are ones that we've been looking at here over the last three weeks. I will have a recording out to you guys as soon as possible. And uh, thanks again for joining me. Have a great night and we'll speak soon. Bye everyone. <laughs>